And then we have a really short chapter, 15. It says, uh, and, and by the way, it may be that this short chapter could be seen as the interlude between the sixth and the seventh angel. We've had six angels in chapter 14. And as I said, the seventh angel could be identified with the combination of all seven of the last angels who bring the last plagues. And this interlude is in between, as there is always an interlude between the sixth and the seventh item in a series, except as we shall see in this last series. This is the last judgments. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. Now that was seen in heaven previously before the throne, so this must be a scene in heaven. And those who have the victory over the beast, probably because they died, that was their victory. Remember, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and did not love their lives even to the death. Dying, faithful, is victory in Revelation. They had victory over the beast, over his image, and over the mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sing a song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. Judgment against Jerusalem was manifested, and the result is all nations. Now hear the gospel. The gospel goes out beyond the Jewish mission to all the nations. And as a result of his judgments being made manifest, all nations as a result, will come and worship before him. After these things, I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. That's a long connection, a, a string of phrases. The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open, and out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls, full of wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, just as it was when Solomon built the temple and when, and when Moses uh, built the tabernacle. In Exodus 40, verses 34 and 35, it says, When Moses erected the tabernacle, the glory of God filled it like a cloud, and the priest, Moses couldn't go in, it says. Now, when Solomon built the temple, in 1 Kings chapter 8, Verses 10 and 11, it says that smoke filled the temple there too. The glory of the Lord in a cloud filled the temple. And it says the priests could not go in to minister. Here we read, the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. God is about to be glorified in his new temple because the old one is defunct. Remember Jesus when he left the temple the last time he walked out, he said to the Jews, your house is left to you desolate. Now, earlier in his ministry, he said, my father's house. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise or of thieves. But that was early on. At the end of his ministry, it's not his father's house anymore. His father's moved out. He said, your house is left to you desolate. You will not see me anymore until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The house in Jerusalem was abandoned by God. He moved into a new house made of living stones. The church of the living God, which is the house of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so God's temple, as it were, in, in heaven, the real temple, is now got his glory. The old temple's been abandoned. But that no one was able to enter the temple might even suggest that there's no more any intercession being made. You go to the temple to pray that uh, Jerusalem's going down. And it's too late to pray. Just like in Jeremiah's day, God repeatedly said to Jeremiah, don't pray for these people. Don't pray for these people. Don't pray for these people. Why? Because they've gone too far. They're doomed now. We talk about Jerusalem being destroyed by the Babylonians. As Jerusalem was about ready to be destroyed by the Romans, it may be that this is the message that is given in here. People can't go in the temple until the judgment has come down because it's too late to pray for these people. Now, real quickly... Chapter 16, you might say, what? Quickly, 16? Yes, 
because I won't make as many comments about 16. But, it says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth, or on the land. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the land, or earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Now if, if the beast is, let's say, the Roman Empire, worshipping the beast, you think, well, the Jews didn't do that. They hated Rome. They're not worshippers of the beast. How could this be Jerusalem that's plagued like this if it's them who worship the beast? Do you remember that when Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? The Jews said, we have no king but Caesar. They were given the choice. Do you want Jesus or Caesar? We'll take Caesar. They put Caesar in the place of their Messiah. That's worshiping the beast. That's taking the beast's side against God. That is what they did. And what comes on them is a loathsome sore. Now, no doubt, in the siege of Jerusalem, with all the infection and, and so forth that Josephus described, I'm sure people had sores all over them. We get sores on us from just a little bit of contamination from things. And we live in a very sterile world compared to the horrible conditions that were in Jerusalem during the five-month siege that Josephus described as horrendous. They may have had sores all over their bodies, but more important than the literal is the symbolic. Because sores or boils was one of the plagues of Egypt. And Revelation sees a recurrence of the plagues of Egypt. You've got plagues of water turning to blood. You've got plagues of boils, you've got plague, plagues of darkness, you've got plagues of frogs, you've got plagues of locusts. You've got, in Revelation, a recurrence of the plagues of Egypt. Now, not literally. Revelation is apocalyptic. The descriptions convey ideas more than pictures of what you'd really see if you were there, necessarily. In fact, we've been told that Jerusalem is spiritually called Egypt. Egypt was judged by plagues such as these. And therefore, it's appropriate for the symbolic description of the judgment of the spiritual Egypt to have corresponding plagues. And so, the first uh, bowl of wrath corresponds with the sixth plague of Egypt, which was boils. Verse 3, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Now, when the second trumpet was sounded, back in uh, chapter 8, a third of the sea turned into blood. And a third of the things in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed, and so forth. Now it's the whole thing. Remember, the turning of water into blood is also an Egyptian plague. And so we see, remember I read to you when we were talking about the, the second trumpet, Josephus described a battle in, on the Sea of Galilee where the Romans just butchered the Galileans out in boats. And uh, even he said when the, when the Galileans tried to swim to the Romans for help, they cut off their heads or cut off their hands when they came to their boats. And he said that the next day, he said, if you looked at the Sea of Galilee, he said, it looked all blood. Josephus said, it looked all bloody. And you'd see the abundance of swollen dead bodies on the shore and shipwrecks, he said. The very kinds of things that Revelation seems to be describing. In any case, these are impressionistic judgments, not necessarily literal, but in some measure they correspond to things that really did happen literally. But the more important thing is their likeness to the plagues of Egypt. Verse 4, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. Now when the, the third trumpet sounded, the rivers and springs of water became wormwood, and people died from drinking the bitter waters. This time it's blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be. Because you have judged these things, for they, the ones who are being judged, they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. Now this is a, a, a dead giveaway of who we're talking about here. They have shed, shed the blood of saints and prophets. <coughs> Look at Luke chapter 13 real quick. Luke chapter 13, none less than Jesus makes this comment. Luke 13, 33. 
through 35. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be, it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, and assuredly I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes. When you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Your house is being abandoned by God. You are uh, the one who kills the prophets, Jerusalem. It can hardly be imagined that a prophet would perish anywhere else, Jesus says. It can't be that a prophet would perish outside Jerusalem. Now look at Matthew 23. Again, Jesus is the speaker here. Matthew 23, 35 and 36. Jesus said that on you, he's speaking to Jerusalem, in case you wonder, you can go up a, a few uh, verses earlier. And he says that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come on this generation so, who, who's paying the price for the blood of the martyrs? The prophets and all that? Jesus said, all their blood is going to come on your head, and it's going to be in this generation. The destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, Jesus interpreted it as the just due for all the prophets that Jerusalem had killed. And that generation was going to pay the price. What does Revelation 15 say? These people are drinking blood. It's their just due because they've shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. This is not similarity. This is identity. You can't have all the blood of the prophets being punished on the generation of Jews Jesus is speaking to and also have it someone else punished at some other time for it. This is the punishment for those who killed the prophets. We're reading about here. This is the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, Revelation 16, 7, I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then verse 8, Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Now, the sun scorching people, this is symbolic. Although people who are futurists sometimes say, well, this is going to be like when the ozone layer is depleted and, you know, we're, we get too much radiation and so forth and, and we'll die from that. Well, that may happen in the future, but that's not what this is talking about, I don't believe. That's the wrong time frame. The sun scorching is symbolic just as the sun not scorching is symbolic in other passages where promises are made to Israel and to others. For example, earlier in chapter 7... And uh, verse 16, chapter 7, verse 16, it was talking about the multitude that came out of the great tribulation. It says, they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the consolation given to God's people. Among other things, the sun shall not smite them. But that even comes from earlier passages like Isaiah chapter 49. And in Isaiah chapter 49, a promise to Israel, that is to the remnant of Israel. We have to understand there's a difference between Israel, the nation, and, and the remnant. He says to them in Isaiah 49, 10, they shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them even by springs of water. He will guide them. So this is obviously the, the verse that Revelation 7 is alluding to. But in Psalm 121 and verse 5 and 6, it says, The Lord is your keeper. This is Psalm 121, verses 5 and 6. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. 
He shall preserve your soul. Now this, this is a you know, poetic way of talking about being protected from all evil. The sun won't strike in the day, and the moon won't strike by night. I never heard of anyone getting moonstroke. Sunstroke, maybe. Moonstroke, do people get moonstroke? Do, does the moon strike people at night? No, this is, be, this is poetry. The idea is that nothing in the universe will hurt you when God is protecting you. You see, the imagery of God protecting you from the sun and from scorching and moon even, is this is the opposite. Now, God is not protecting them. Everything hurts. Everything is against them. The whole world, the whole universe is, as it were, against them. They're scorched by the sun. And they don't repent. It's, I believe, symbolic. Now, Revelation 16, 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain, and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of the pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. Now, the throne of the beast. We're, we're encountering here characters that we've, in, that we've been introduced to previously. The beast first appeared in chapter 11, coming out of the bottomless pit to make war with the two witnesses. Then the beast came out of the sea, when we had our first actual description of him in chapter 13. Later, we'll see the woman riding on the beast. Clearly, these chapters are not chronological. But the beast is a known entity already in Revelation. And then later in verse 19, we see the city of Babylon. That's a known entity too. And we know from chapter 17 that the beast hates the, the whore, Babylon, and destroys her with fire. The beast, most would say, in the time of John, was Rome. And Babylon, no doubt, not, and certainly not all would say this, but there's lots of opinions about Babylon, but I've told you I believe Babylon is another name for Jerusalem, just as Sodom and Egypt are other names for Jerusalem in Revelation. Um, something happens to Rome, and something happens to Jerusalem around the same time. The fifth angel poured his ball on the throne of the beast. That would presumably be Rome. And his kingdom became full of darkness, and people were agonizing in it. What happened in Rome around the time that Jerusalem was being judged? Well, a number of things. Um, Jerusalem, of course, was at war from 66 to 70 AD. During part of that time, 64 to 68, the church in Rome was being persecuted. But in 68 AD, Nero, the persecutor, committed suicide. And when Nero committed suicide, there was not a natural successor. So for 18 months, Rome was torn by civil war. Generals and pretenders made themselves Caesar for a few months at a time. And then they were killed by the next guy who wanted to be Caesar. And so you had, after Nero, there was Galba, then Otho, then Vicellus. These three rose and fell within a single year and a half. One of them ruled for, I think, one month, if I'm not mistaken, another for three months. Uh, this was a time of turmoil in Rome. Historians like Gibbon, who's the most famous historian of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, suggest that it's almost a miracle that the Roman Empire survived it because of the tremendous turmoil. Well, there was starvation, there was civil war, there was killing in the streets, and this was going on in Rome, the capital city, for a year and a half up until 70 AD, actually. So that the Jewish war corresponded in time with what was going on in Rome when Nero was dead. It was called the, the year of the, of the five emperors. Because Nero was the first, then there were three, and then, of course, Vespasian became uh, uh, emperor. He had been besieging Jerusalem before he went back to Rome to become the emperor and, and stop all this. Then he sent his son Titus back to besiege and destroy Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was coming under this at the same time Rome was coming under something. The, the throne of the beast was under judgment as well because of the persecution Nero had brought against the church. And so we have the fifth angel representing this judgment that came upon Rome at the same time that Jerusalem was under judgment. Then the sixth, verse 12, 
Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, I've mentioned before that the kings of the east are sometimes thought to be China by modern uh, dispensational prophecy interpreters. And uh, the drying up of the river Euphrates, for example, Hal Lindsey and other interpreters like them have suggested that uh, the river Euphrates will be dried up so that the Chinese armies can march on Israel for the Battle of Armageddon. We will read about the Battle of Armageddon in verse 16. So we're in that time frame. So we've got what futurists say are the Chinese armies. The armies mentioned under the sixth trumpet had 200 million men, and Hal thinks those are the same armies, so that they believe that China will have 200 million men marching. Mao Zedong once said that they could field an army of 200 million men, and Hal Lindsey believed that was a confirmation of his theory. So he believed, Hal Lindsey said that up in Russia, or somewhere, they, somewhere the Russians had built it, not in Russia, but somewhere up north, uh, on the river Euphrates, the Russians had built a dam. And he believes that they'll dam up the river and dry up the river so the Chinese armies can march through it. And they think that's what's talked about here. The river Euphrates is dried up to make way for the kings of the east. Now, I don't know if those who suggest this have given much thought to how unlikely that scenario is. First of all, armies do not need to dry up rivers to cross over them now. In the old days they did. In John's day they did. In Old Testament they did, but... Armies are not obstructed by rivers. You don't have to drive a river. We use airplanes, helicopters, amphibious troop carriers, amphibious tanks. Uh, rivers are not a problem. You don't have to drive up a river to make the way for an army, a modern army, to invade an area. In fact, why would the Chinese even send 200 million men to the Middle East when they could just send a missile? It's very expensive sending the troops. And what, are they marching from China to the Middle East? That's expensive and slow. Or are they going to fly in to some place nearby and then march in across the Euphrates? What is it that is being pictured here? Someone really believes there's 200 million Chinese going to be marching through the desert from China to invade Israel? Why? The only reason the Chinese would send troops is if they want to occupy if they just want to destroy, they can send missiles. They, they can stay home. This idea of the drying up of the river Euphrates to let Chinese armies march through, to me, it's, it's not realistic. And there's a much more realistic understanding of this to me. We're reading about the fall of Babylon, right? Mystery Babylon. Babylon falls in verse 19. The imagery is of the destruction of the spiritual Egypt and the spiritual Babylon. The two cities who in history enslaved Israel and who were judged by God so that Israel would be saved. And in the salvation of the new Israel, there is the destruction of the new Egypt and of the new Babylon. And the plagues of Revelation recall the destruction of Egypt and the drying of the river Euphrates and the kings of the east recall the destruction of Babylon. You remember how Babylon fell, don't you? Cyrus, the king of the east, Persian, brought his armies from the east and they dried up the river back, uh, Euphrates and marched under the walls to Babylon and de defeated it. This imagery is simply talking about God bringing armies, which in the event turned out to be Roman armies, and removing what are obstacles that allow them to break through the walls and, and get at Jerusalem, which is the new Babylon. The imagery <coughs> is, of course, symbolic. And people might get tired of me saying, it's symbolic, it's symbolic, it's symbolic. But hey, Revelation is symbolic. Deal with it. It's not literal. Not very often. Even Jesus is a lamb 27 times in the book, but he's not literally a lamb. Satan is a dragon with seven heads and ten horns, but he's not literally a, a reptile with seven heads and ten horns. So that's symbolism. Everything in Revelation is symbolism. And that doesn't mean there's nothing literal going on that the symbols refer to. But it means that we can't just, I mean, just because it says the river Euphrates dries up for the kings of the east, we need to say, what is, the, what is the idea this is trying to convey from Old Testament history, the fall of Babylon? And we're talking about Babylon falling here. So this is about the invasion against the new Babylon, which came, of course, 
from, by the way, the 10th uh, Legion, I think it was, of, of Rome, played a major role in the Siege of Jerusalem, and they were stationed at the River Euphrates uh, until, the, until they were called in. The River Euphrates was the eastern boundary of the Roman Empire, and so it was a border to be defended, and there was a, a, a legion of Roman soldiers there, uh, or I don't know if they're called, uh, if it was a legion, some kind of unit of soldiers that were brought in uh, from the River Euphrates to, against Jerusalem, but that may or may not be significant because I don't know that we have to make the River Euphrates be literal, but if we want it to be, the Romans came from there, from the east. Now he says in verse 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs, like a flake of frogs, only three this time. These are said to be demons coming out of the mouth of the dragon, who is Satan, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false, false prophet. Remember I said that I don't believe these are references to individuals. The beasts in Daniel were not individuals, they were kingdoms. The beast in Revelation is kingdom, not individual. And these frogs are not really frogs, but it's like, recalls the plague of frogs from Egypt. And these are false, these are evil spirits. For they are the spirits of demons, it says in verse 14, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they, be gathered, they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon, which means the mountain of Megiddo. Arm, Arma is mountain, mountain of Megiddo. Now, um, okay, these, the demons from the devil and the beast of the false prophet are drawing the nations, this would be the Roman troops which are made up of all the nations that Rome had conquered, to this place, this battle. Where is it? It's in Israel, of course. Armageddon is a reference to a location up in northern Israel. It's actually the, the valley of Megiddo. Armageddon is a strange word that means mountain of Megiddo, and there really isn't a mountain called Megiddo. Mount Carmel is there. Mount Carmel is probably the closest mountain to the valley of Megiddo, and it may be a reference to Carmel, but uh, if it is, it may be a reference to Elijah's showdown with the prophets there, Baal, I don't know, but, but mountain of Megiddo is a strange phrase because there isn't such a mountain by that name. But there's a valley of Megiddo, and that is a place where lots of battles were fought in Israel's history. The most significant of which was when Josiah went out to resist Pharaoh Necho. Pharaoh Necho was going up to Carchemish to face Nebuchadnezzar, who was rising in 605 B.C. And uh, at Carchemish, uh, of course, Pharaoh Necho was defeated. But Josiah tried to prevent Pharaoh Necho from going, went to intercept him, and got himself killed. Josiah died at, in the Valley of Megiddo. It was a place of mourning. It was a place of destruction. It was a place of defeat for Israel. And it is no doubt why it is mentioned here as the place where this battle is going to be fought, as it were. Is it literally going to be at the Valley of Megiddo? Not necessarily. The whole land of Israel was full of blood, remember? The Romans came into Galilee first and made their way to Jerusalem. For three and a half years, the whole land was at war. Certainly the Valley of Megiddo saw its share. But the point here is that it's like the, the loss that Israel suffered at Megiddo before. This is, this is destruction. This is defeat for Israel. And it's the great day of God Almighty. Now, we've, experienced, we've, we've seen in the Old Testament references to the great day of the Lord. Uh, Joel called it the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Malachi called it the great and terrible day of the Lord. Both of the contexts of Joel and Malachi place it in the first century. Joel places it right after Pentecost. Joel said that the Spirit of the Lord would be poured out, and then there would be fire and blood and vapor of smoke and that, before that great and terrible day of the Lord. Peter quoted that passage on the day of Pentecost and said it was being fulfilled at that time. The outpouring of the Spirit, and by implication, the soon blood, fire, and vapor of smoke and the terrible day of the Lord. Malachi said that Elijah would be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And Jesus said, if you can receive it, John the Baptist is Elijah who is to come. 
So Malachi is talking about John the Baptist coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Joel talks about the point of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. What's the great and dreadful day of the Lord? Well, John the Baptist came and warned them that, he, that God was about to throw the chaff into the fire and the fruitless trees in the fire. This is the judgment that Jesus said would come on that generation. It's the battle of the great day of God Almighty. It's God's judgment upon those who crucified his son and remained unrepentant. Of course, not all the Jews remained unrepentant. There were the church in Jerusalem. There were Christian Jews, but they escaped this. This was God's battle avenging the death of his son and of the prophets whose blood had been shed. Jesus said all their blood is going to come on this generation. This was the generation it happened to. Last bowl, quickly. Then the seventh angel poured out the bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple in heaven saying, uh, from the throne, saying, it is done. This is the final downfall. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the city of the nations fell. In the Greek it says the city of the nations, not the cities of the nations, fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, and every island fled away, and every mountain, the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, every hailstone about the weight of a talent, that's a hundred pounds, and men blasphemed God because of the plague and the hail, uh, since that plague was exceeding great. Now, when it's all done, a voice in heaven says, it is done, and then there's, what, noises and thunderings and lightnings. These have been mentioned several times. And each time they're mentioned, something more is added to them. A few chapters back, they added an earthquake. Then, the next time, there was an earthquake and hail. This time, they don't add more things. They just add intensity to both the earthquake and the hail. The earthquake is the worst ever. The <coughs> hail, incredible. 100-pound hailstone. A terrible judgment. This is, of course, apocalyptic imagery. When it says at the end of verse 18, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. I mean, there could be such an earthquake that's that way, but Jesus spoke that way about the destruction of Jerusalem. He said it'd be like nothing before, nothing after. In fact, Ezekiel spoke that way about the destruction of Israel in his day. In Ezekiel 5, one, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Ezekiel 5, I think it was verse 9, he said that what God was about to do in Jerusalem was like nothing he'd done before or would ever do again. It's hyperbole, of course, but the idea is it's almost unique. It's extremely uh, rare to have something this terrible happen. And the city was divided into three parts. What's that mean? Well, Josephus tells us that during the siege of Jerusalem, the population inside that were besieged divided into three warring camps. The city divided into three parts that way. And some people think that's what is meant here. But I think not. I think Ezekiel 5 gives the answer. Because in Ezekiel chapter 5, it says in verse 1, And you, son of man, take a sharp sword, take it as a barber's razor, and pass it over your head and your beard, and take the balances and weigh and divide the hair. Cut off all your hair and weigh it out into portions. You shall burn with fire one-third in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are finished. Then you shall take one-third and strike around it with the sword. And one-third... You shall scatter in the wind, and I will draw out a sword after it. Now in verse 5, Ezekiel 5, 5, God explains what this is about. He said, this, thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries round about her. She has rebelled against my judgment, etc., etc. He's saying basically, she'll be divided into three fates. Some, a third will die by the sword, a third will be burned in fire, and a third will be scattered in the wind that is displaced dispersed around the world. He said, you divide your hair into thirds, and that's what I'm going to do to Jerusalem. The city is divided into thirds. This imagery comes from Ezekiel. It's about Jerusalem. And it says, he gives her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now, the earthquake is so bad that figuratively it says, every island fled away and the mountains were not found. This was also said when the uh, sixth uh, when the sixth seal was broken. In chapter 6, verse 14, that all the mountains and islands moved around then too or, or, or disappeared or something. It's a 
course, apocalyptic imagery. It's an earthquake. Everything's shaking. You can find this in the Old Testament, plenty. For example, even in Zechariah 4, it says, Who are you, O mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you become a plain. The mountain in front of Zerubbabel is going to be removed. Or a mountain splits in two and makes a valley in, in Zechariah chapter 14. Or in some of the other prophets, the mountains melt or tremble or skip. Mountains do those kinds of things in apocalyptic imagery. They don't do it in real life. And that's not what's, we're not supposed to be seeing this as a literal situation. This is a disaster movie. This is basically trying to give us an impression of how great this disaster is. But there are literal things about it, certainly. The city did fall, and great hail fell. In verse 21 it says, Great hail from heaven fell upon men, every hailstone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the hail, etc. Now, that's how this ends. What about these hailstones? Well, much of it, as I say, is symbolic. And some of it is, has literal correspondence. With reference to the talent weight hailstones, there's an interesting passage that Josephus wrote. He was there. Josephus was a participant in that war. He was there and he wrote the history of it afterwards. And when he was um, describing how the Romans were attacking Jerusalem with catapults, he referred to the catapults as engines. They were war engines. This is a paragraph from, from Josephus. It's very interesting. He's talking about the Romans attacking Jerusalem. He says, the engines that the Roman legions had ready prepared for them were admirably contrived, but still more extraordinary ones belonged to the 10th legion. That's the ones I mentioned who came from the river Euphrates. Those that threw darts, meaning arrows, and those that threw stones were more forcible and larger than the rest, by which they not only repelled the excursions of the Jews, but drove away those that were upon the walls also. So these stones and arrows were being thrust by catapults over the walls and driving away people from the, defending the walls. Now the stones that were cast were the weight of a talent. Isn't that interesting? Jerusalem pelted with stones the weight of a talent and were carried two furlongs and farther. The blow that they gave was no way to be sustained, not only by those that stood first in the way, but by those that were beyond them by a great distance. As for the Jews, they at first watched for the coming of the stone, for it was of a white color. Josephus did not read the book of Revelation. It describes Jerusalem being pelted with white stones about a talent weight. It sounds more like ha uh, hailstones, a talent weight, than almost anything else could be imagined. He says, they could therefore not only be perceived by the great noise it made, but could be seen also before it came by its brightness, apparently in the... Uh, night sky. They probably felt the city at night, so the white color of the stone was easy to spot against the dark sky. Accordingly, the watchmen that sat upon the towers gave them notice when the engine was let go, and the stone came from it, and they cried out aloud in their own country language, the sun cometh, S-O-N, by the way. We'll comment on that in a moment. So those that were in its way stood off and threw themselves uh, down upon the ground, by which means, and by their thus guarding themselves, the stone fell down and did them no harm. But the Romans contrived how to prevent that by blackening the stones, who when then could aim at them with success when the stone was not discerned beforehand. Of course, it was nighttime, so the black stones could not be seen then. And it says, uh, and, and so they destroyed many of them at a blow, it says. And, and that's the end of that paragraph. That's in Wars of the Jews, book 5, chapter 6, paragraph 3. But he says that there were these white stones about a talent weight falling on Jerusalem. In apocalyptic language, that could be talked about as a hailstorm of white stones, a talent weight. But what's interesting is that Josephus says that when the watchmen saw the stone coming, initially they were warning the people when they saw it, and they said, the sun cometh, S-O-N cometh. Some scholars have speculated that it's a misprint or a miscopy, and that it originally said, the stone cometh. That would make sense. The stone's coming. You know, that makes sense. However, that works better in English than in Greek. 
so it, it's not likely that it was the stone coming. And so there's been speculation. Many have speculated that the Jews, having heard from the Christians that Jesus was going to come and judge the city, when these stones came, they were mocking, saying, oh, here comes the son that they said is coming, the son of man is coming to destroy our city, the sun's coming. You see, Stephen was stoned to death because they accused him of saying that Jesus of Nazareth would come and destroy the temple. And he was stoned for that report. He was right, of course. Jesus did destroy the temple through the Romans. But the Jews despised the Christians for this message and may very well have been mocking them when they said, oh, the sun is coming. But that's not the most important thing. It's just an interesting side note. The interesting thing is that Josephus, who had no knowledge of what the book of Revelation said, because he was not a Christian and uh, probably was not even living where the book of Revelation was in circulation. He was later in Rome, not in Asia Minor, that he talks about these stones, these white stones falling, and he mentions their weight. And it corresponds exactly with what Revelation says. This was the fall of Jerusalem. And so, chapters 14 through 16, I believe, give us the final plagues. So what's left if those are the last plagues? There's still the fall of Babylon looked at as a separate subject in chapters 17 and 18 and 19. Then we've got the millennium in chapter 20. That's going to be interesting. And then we have the new heavens and new earth, and that's all that is left of Revelation for us. And we'll be covering that in the remaining sessions.